The Primary Visual Cortex V1, Part 2, Receptive Fields. Recall that retinal ganglion cells have centers around receptive fields. In V1, many neurons have their receptive field as if made by adding a spatial arrangement of receptive fields together. As a result, the receptive fields are often tuned to a spatial orientation. In this example, this neuron can be excited by a horizontally oriented white bar. So V1 receptive fields tend to be somewhat larger than retinal ganglion cells receptive fields at the same spatial location. Another spatial arrangement can make another V1 cell be excited by a vertical white bar or by a vertical contrast or edge between white and black or by a tilted white bar or another tilt and at a smaller edge. It's a smaller edge here. So V1 neurons are often called bar or edge detectors and their responses are tuned to orientation of visual inputs and also tuned to scale of visual inputs. With this coordinate system centered on the neuron's rest of field, then a linear neuron's rest of field is often modeled by a Gabor filter like this one. The width and height of the filter are determined by parameters sigma x and sigma y to give this Gaussian envelope for the Gabor filter. The cosine wave within this envelope has this frequency k hat. Without the Gaussian envelope, this wave would look like this one. And this phi is the face of this wave, in this case phi equal to zero, so that the center of the receptive field is white. So this neuron prefers a white bar, so it has phi equal to zero. This one prefers an edge. It has phi equal to minus 90 degrees in this example. If neurons prefer orientation theta, then rotate the coordinate system this way. For this small receptive field, we need smaller sigma x and sigma y for a smaller Gaussian envelope and a larger k hat for a shorter wavelength of the sinusoidal wave within the Gaussian envelope. One can expect that a visual input grating with this frequency k hat should be able to excite this neuron well. This Gaussian envelope helps this neuron to be excited by gratings of other frequencies close to k hat. Specifically, the preferred frequencies by this neuron are in a Gaussian envelope around the center frequency k hat, described by this frequency tuning curve. And this sigma x squared on the numerator means that the range of the preferred frequencies is inversely related to this sigma x. So therefore, neurons with larger resistive fields should have narrower frequency tuning width now let's denote the high and low ends of this frequency tuning curve by KH and KL. In V1 neurons, typically KH is three times KL. So when the bandwidth is measured by octaves, this means 1.5 octaves is the typical bandwidth for V1 neurons. Let's recall that the contrast sensitivity function of uh, retinal ganglion cells. It covers a frequency range much larger than 1.5 octaves, so that a tuning curve with a 1.5 octave width would, for example, sit like this. Similarly, human contrast sensitivity functions also span a range much larger than 1.5 octaves. So therefore, different V1 cells tuned to different frequency ranges are needed to cover the whole frequency range. Some are tuned to higher frequencies, so have smaller resistive fields. Some are tuned to lower frequencies with larger resistive fields. And this is so even for a single visual location. We have such a diversity of V1's neural resistive fields for a multi-scale representation of visual inputs. Indeed, here are 17 example neurons 
recorded by a single penetration of a recording electrode in monkey V1. This rectangle outlines the resistive field of the 14th neuron. Its width and length are larger than one degree in visual angle. And here is another neuron and it has a resistive field smaller than one degree in both length and width. And these resistive fields partially overlap with each other and they are at a location 10 degrees from the center of gaze. And you can imagine that these different neurons are most likely tuned to different spatial frequencies and also to different orientations. In a two-dimensional image space, and therefore with two-dimensional frequency vectors for spatial gratings of different orientations, different orientations of resistive fields mean different directions of the preferred bands of spatial frequencies in this two-dimensional frequency space. Here is a frequency band in which the frequencies have smaller magnitudes, so it gives a larger resistive field. This frequency band, centered on the zero frequency at origin, has no special direction for the preferred frequencies. Therefore, the largest resistive fields do not prefer any orientation. This is the frequency band when the frequency tuning is only plotted in one dimension by the magnitude of the preferred frequencies. In V1, there are indeed a minority of neurons not tuned to any orientation with large residue fields. Let's recall that sensitivity to chromatic inputs are focused on lower spatial frequencies than the sensitivities to luminance signals. So many neurons tuned to color are not tuned to orientation, and they should have large resistive fields. These neurons are tuned to both color and orientation, smaller resistive fields, but V1 neurons with the smallest resistive fields are tuned to orientation, but not to color. This is summarized by this schematic. With V1 neurons with the largest resistive fields tuned to color, they are called double opponent cells since they are opponent in both space between the center and surround and also in color between the red and green in this example. In comparison, these uh, retinogenia cells we have seen are called single opponent in the literature. V1 neurons of intermediate sized resistive fields can be tuned to both color and orientation, but V1 neurons with smallest resistive fields are not tuned to color and they are orientation tuned. Starting from this spatial resistive field, preferring a vertical white bar with space X and Y, let's study a neuron's spatial temporal tuning property by removing the y dimension to focus on the x dimension only and adding the time dimension to show this spatial temporal residue field with space x along here and time t here along in this direction. And uh, this spatial temporal filter is a space-time separable filter because it's roughly a product between this spatial filter coming from this residue field and this temporal impulse response function. This neuron's initial response prefers a white bar and its later response prefers a black bar. So this neuron with such a residue field should be excited by a flashing vertical bar. Here is another space-time separable residue field. Its spatial filter is modified from this Gabor filter from the right by a 90 degree phase shift in the Gabor filter. So it prefers an edge rather than a bar. Its temporal filter is also a 90 degree phase shifted version of the temporal filter from the right. And such a filter can be excited by a flashing edge. Combining these two filters can give a space-time non-separable filter. Its current response can be excited by a white bar at location x1 
at time t1 in the past and also by a white bar at location x2 at a longer time t2 in the past. So this filter's current response prefers a movement by a white bar from x2 to x1, a rightward motion during the time window t1 to t2 in the past. So this neuron is a motion direction selective neuron. V1 has many motion direction selective neurons, each preferring one particular motion direction over an opposite direction. And some V1 neurons are more sensitive to motion direction than others. For instance, this one has a very strong preference for the direction of the motions. And these two filters respond equally well to leftward or rightward motion. Many V1 neurons are in between these two extremes so that they respond somewhat more strongly to their preferred direction than the opposite directions. This is how visual objects project images in the left eye and the right eye. In front of the eyes, we have a far object, a near object, and a center focus. Both eyes are focused on this object, so in both retina, this object projects to the center of the image. However, to this object further away, for the right eye, it is on the same line of sight in this special example as the object at the fixation focus, so it also projects to the image center, but for the left eye, it's shifted to the left of the center in the input image by this amount. Although on the retina, it's shifted to the right, but let's only refer to the image location representations from our perspective in front of the eyes. This object is nearer to the eyes, it projects to the two eyes like this. The image location is shifted from the image center by XL, this amount, for the left eye, and by this amount XR for the right eye. And the difference between these two image locations in the left and right eyes is called binocular disparity. And its value indicates how far an object is. So we consider input signals to the left and right eyes. A V1 neuron's response can be contributed by signals from both eyes like this. Here is the field filter for the left eye visual input and for the right eye visual input. This is the example of these two resistive field filters for a single neuron. This is the filter for the left eye and this is the filter for the right eye. They are both modeled as Gabor filters, but drawn here only along the X dimension for illustration. The preferred location for the left eye input is at this location, XL, and at this location, XR, uh, for the preferred location for the right eye. So this neuron should be excited by an input disparity of XL minus XR. These preferred locations can be modeled by these parameters in these Gabor filter models. V1 has many disparity selective neurons to signal visual inputs at different depths in our three-dimensional visual world. The amplitude for the left eye's resistive field filter is larger than that for the right eye's filter. These are modeled by these two different values, GL and GR. So this neuron is more sensitive to the inputs from the left eye than the right eye. Such differential sensitivities is called ocular dominance. In V1, some neurons prefer inputs from the left eye and some prefer inputs from the right eye, and these neurons are called monocular neurons. Other V1 neurons are equally sensitive to the two eyes. They are called binocular neurons. Neighboring V1 neurons tend to prefer the same eye. Using optic imaging, one can uh, visualize uh, these clustering of V1 neurons preferring different eyes. The dark and light stripes are from neurons preferring one eye or the other eye. 
and these stripes are called uh, the ocular dominance columns and each stripe is about 400 microns thick. This image also includes a segment of the neighboring brain region V2 which is the next stage along the visual pathway from V1. And there are no ocular dominance columns in V2 because all V2 neurons are binocular. This difference between V1 and V2 is very useful to identify brain areas for specific visual processes, as we will see later in this book.